Hey everyone, it's White Cross, and you have joined me for Stacking Mexican Silver Volume 4, Video B. This is going to be the 1980s to the present. If you are new to the channel, I want to thank you for joining the community here today. Hopefully you will be as informed as you are entertained. And if you are one of my returning subscribers, thank you guys as always for being with me here again today. It means a lot to me. I like to begin each of my videos with a simple disclaimer, and that is I am not a financial advisor. I'm not trying to offer you any kind of financial advice. I'm simply trying to share some of my experience as I have been buying and selling precious metals and rare coins for the last 30 or 40 years. And I also like to begin each of my videos with a concept or two. And in this case, the concept I wanted to bounce off of you was the idea of what is legal tender. Legal tender is a form of money that is recognized as legally satisfactory in retiring a debt. So what that means is that, for example, if you owe somebody some money, you can't present them with a stack of wet newspapers and tell them that their debt has been satisfied and that you no longer owe them anything. You have to pay them back in a form of money that is accepted in whatever uh, locality, municipality in which you uh, reside. And while constitutions and legislation have a lot to do with what is legally acceptable as legal tender, it's often the courts that decide what that legality really is, what uh, units or items can be used as legal tender money. And we're going to touch that legal tender idea a little bit later when we talk about two of the pieces that we're talking about specifically here today. The other idea that I wanted to just put forth was the idea of innovation. And this is a, a, a pretty common term, but technically innovation means the practice and implementation of ideas that result in improved or new goods and services. And I think that that is really uh, appropriate for what we're talking about in this video, these uh, modern late 20th century, early 21st century Mexican silver pieces. I think it really comes into play. So I want to put what we've talked about here in context. And the reason that we ended the last video with that Grove metal that showed the enormous Mexican mint coin press on it, that's what that device was. And you can see it again here. Uh, a little bit more clearly, is that we're going to be talking about the Onza and the Libertad. And I want to touch on the context with which these were released, the, the physical, the period of time, the chronological. I think it all really comes into play. We showed in the last video those really graphic representations of just how quickly uh, the peso and the silver content of the peso had depreciated with inflation, with a rising value of silver to the point where a silver peso had gone from 72% pure silver to 50% to 30% to 10% in a matter of 12 years. That's a pretty dramatic uh, drop in the amount of silver contained in this currency. And I think it's logical to see that the Mexican people were very anxious under those kinds of circumstances to at least try to preserve some of their wealth and protect some of it with silver. Again, silver, an incredibly important commodity for Mexico, something that had been an important currency for people of Mexico for hundreds of years. And remember the last video, we were talking about the CN pesos, these hundred pesos, and the fact that that was a, a later 1979 release. And it's interesting to think that this is something that was a circulating circulating coin in Mexico. But again, you often see these pieces that have not been circulated. And that's an indication that these were being maybe hoarded is too strong of a word, but certainly put back just in case by the Mexican people who were able to get their hands on it. So it's in that context that we're looking at these later pieces, silver being in a very important way for the people of Mexico to protect some of their purchasing power. The context is not just limited to Mexico. We've talked many, many times about how uh, the circulating coinage of the United States had been 90% silver for hundreds of years, or 150, 175 years, up until and including 1964. At that point, 
we greatly reduced the amount of silver in our silver half dollars. They went from 90% to 40%, and they stayed that way up until 1970. But after 1964, those subsidiary pieces, the dime and the quarter, no longer had any silver in them at all. So this is the context that we're looking at. This is the period of time that we're examining. Silver had been seen as money for thousands of years. It had been seen as wealth since before the invention of coins. But after the invention of coins in about 600 BC, it had been considered money. Silver was money for uh, centuries, for millennia, and for countries and civilizations around the world. So again, we're looking at that context. We're looking at the very end of silver being used in circulation for the first time probably in history. And context again, wrapping your head around it, it's really kind of difficult to see if you were one of the people that was growing up in this period of time. You saw your silver in Mexico being 72% pure, like some of these pieces, being 90% pure, like some of these pieces. And in America, you saw a very similar thing with our coins being 90% silver as well. To wrap your head around the idea that that was never going to be concerned, uh, considered currency, considered money ever again, is a pretty difficult thing to think about. Uh, we have 2020 hindsight. We certainly could look back on it, and now we take it for granted, and we absolutely accept that after 1964, America really didn't have any 90% silver anymore. But if you were growing up in this period of time, if you were growing up when these coins were actually being released, you were used to it. This was money. So to see the future and to know that this was never going to be part of your circulating coinage ever again is a really pretty radical idea. And it's in that context we want to start taking a look at some of these pieces. So 1978, we know that the uh, 100 uh, cn peso pesos had come out in uh, 1979. That was the last year that they were minted. 1978, uh, Mexico realized, probably with the release of these pieces that were being hoarded, or however you want to call it, stacked, uh, hidden away by so many people in Mexico, and probably to a degree around the world, Mexico realized that there was a need, that there was a desire for silver. Even though silver had been taken out of currency for years, there was clearly still a desire for it. There were still people out there who really wanted it. Again, that context, if you grew up with this as money and it was no longer available to you, it's understandable that some people would be clamoring to find it any way that they could. And in that context, I want to talk just really briefly about our old friend Maria Teresa. So this is a Maria Teresa Toller, and we've talked about her on several occasions. We mentioned her briefly in the Restrike video. This was, for all intents and purposes, the circulating or non-circulating um, silver vehicle that most people in the world could get their hands on. If you lived in a country that hadn't had circulating silver for years and years, and by this time, and I'm talking uh, mid to late 1970s, there were lots of countries that had removed the silver from their currency years and years before, sometimes decades before. But the Austrian Mint continued to release the Maria Theresa Taller, probably for the same reasons that Mexico was releasing their silver coinage, even though they didn't really circulate. And this is a restrike. We've talked about it before. You've got a 1780 date up there. Uh, the Austrian Mint continues to strike these to this day with that 1780 date on them. So these weren't circulating. These weren't pieces that were meant to be spent anywhere in the world. They were really a silver bullion vehicle. And that was what most of the world had as an option if they wanted to invest some of their money, store some of their wealth in silver the Maria Theresa Taller, and the Austrian government has made millions and millions and millions of these for the last 150 years or so. The thing to note about the Maria Theresa Taller is that it is an odd weight and an odd purity. The Maria Theresa Thaler is 83.3% pure, 0.833 fine, and it weighs an odd weight. It's just over 0.75 of a troy ounce. 
So if you are presented with the opportunity to buy a coin today that is 83.3% pure and 75% of a troy ounce, 0.75 of a troy ounce, your initial thought might be, why would I do that? That is an odd weight. That's an odd purity. We uh, talk about all the different um, silver content, all the different silver standards that have been used through time. The 72% Mexican, the 90% Mexican, the 90% American, that 40% Kennedy half. Um, to think about a coin that is made in 83.3% pure silver, that's a pretty odd weight. But these had been sold in the tens and even hundreds of millions for the last hundred years or so. These were not uncommon to see bought in rolls and rolls and rolls and stashed in safe deposit boxes. This was really for a lot of people around the world, particularly people in Europe, but in other places of the world, this was their go-to. In a lot of ways, this might have been the only thing that they could have used as a silver bullion vehicle. But again, kind of an odd weight, kind of an odd purity. So it's more revolutionary when you think about the Mexican pieces, particularly that 1949 Onza that we talked about earlier, and there's that coin press from that Grove metal. This piece being uh, weighed in troy ounces containing one full troy ounce of 999 pure silver in the form of a 92.5% pure silver coin, but also to have its weight given in grams, its weight given in grains, and its purity stated very clearly for all to, undersee, uh, for all to see in, in pretty stark contrast to the Maria Teresa Toller, which contains none of that information. Um, the 1949 peso was a groundbreaking thing, and it is in this context, this desire for silver that Mexico recognized, and its competition being something kind of obscure like the restruck 1780 Maria Teresa Toller, that they released the 1978 um, Onza. And this is a very similar release to that earlier 1949 Onza. There are some design differences between the two, I really do think of them as being different coins. Some people might think of them as being a different type of the same series, but I think they're significantly different enough and such a large period of time had passed that it's really fine to consider them to be entirely different, although one clearly based on the other. The Onza, 1978, a three-year mintage, about 10 million of these were minted. That's a pretty phenomenal number of these. And I think if, if nothing else, it shows that there really was likely a very strong demand for these types of silver bullion products. For Mexico to have released the 100 peso in uh, 1979, that's 72% pure silver. And then to see the need and address it with the Onza in 1978, 1979, and 1980, with that full troy ounce, uh, 925, but with enough metal to make it 0.999 pure silver, a full troy ounce of that, they clearly saw that there was a need and this is how they were addressing it. Uh, interesting, take a look at the 1978s if you ever come across them. I only have a few of them. They made substantially fewer 1978 Onzas than they did the 79 and the 1980. From a mintage of about 10 million total, they only made about 280,000 of those 1978s. So just as a quick aside, keep your eyes open for those 78s, especially as we always talk about if they are in a really nice, brilliant, uncirculated condition with that cartwheel luster that don't look like they've been cleaned or messed with too much. So, uh, lots of different varieties of these, uh, and that's one of the fun things about this. We don't talk about varieties too much. We did mention VAMs a little bit in our 90% silver for advanced stack or silver dollar video, and I can certainly put a link to that video down below. But there are some interesting varieties with these pieces. Uh, you can see in this um, example... And the, the nice thing about these varieties is that they're actually pretty easy to see with the naked eye. In this case, you see that bottom pan of this scale. That's what this is supposed to be, a scale representing justice, but also purity, kind of a double meaning there. You can see that that pan points between the U and the N of Una. Uh, hopefully you can see that okay. Let me bring it up a little bit further. See how it's just kind of pointing to the very end of the N there? Now compare that with this piece. Um, bring this into focus. And you can see that that pan points to the U alone. So can you see the difference between these two? 
I like a variety that you can see with the naked eye. Hopefully you can see that just fine. That's kind of an interesting thing to be able to pick these pieces up and see that they are uh, that there are varieties to them, that they're not just monolithic, that they do, do have a little bit of interesting characteristics to them. Not a huge difference in value. The varieties for these uh, tend not to uh, increase the value of them too much, but there is some interest in uh, different types of varieties for these pieces. So if you are interested in adding a little bit of extra uh, spice to your stacks, look for those varieties, take a look at them. I wanted to mention um, that I was fortunate a few years ago, I went to a local dealer who had just gotten kind of a, a, a pretty big um, assortment of these onzas. And as I've mentioned before, I, I kind of, I, I had discounted these as being sterling silver, something that nobody really wanted. And that was particularly true once these 999 silver pieces, these silver vehicles started coming out then the Onzas started uh, getting less and less love. And these were pieces that were topped, uh, tossed into those dealer's crucibles and were melted down with uh, very little forethought about how scarce they may be one day. I was fortunate enough to go to this dealer who had just gotten about a dozen of these in, uh, and they offered them to me at a pretty good price. Again, this dealer didn't have uh, any interest in the Onzas, and they knew that I like Mexican pieces, so I picked them all up at a pretty good price, took them home, and I was getting ready to pop them into one of my tubes, and we'll talk about these in just a moment. And I realized that these pieces that had been kept in just standard coin flips, just little plastic flips like this, um, had been really well protected. And I will do a video or two or three later on. We'll talk about the different techniques that you can use to protect your coins. I think it's it's a great idea to use kind of proper storage techniques to avoid things like PVC damage, but also because of that attrition that we've talked about many, many times before. The longer you can keep your coins nice and fresh without doing anything to harm them, everybody else's coins are going to suffer from attrition and you're going to win in the end. Remember that long game. So I realized that these pieces, though the two by twos had been badly deteriorated and were falling apart, had done a remarkable job of protecting these Onzas. And I studied them very carefully and realized that these all look to be pretty high grade. So instead of popping them into a coin tube, I shipped them off to NGC and was very fortunate to get most of them graded back MS-66. Now, uh, some 65, some 66, I think there were a couple 64s in the group too. On that Sheldon scale of coin grading, coins are graded on a scale of one to 70. So these came back 66. That's a pretty high grade. And that is a particularly high grade for these early bullion pieces that were tossed around and uh, thrown into uh, boxes and forgotten about for years and years. Uh, uh, MS-66, a pretty high grade. They also have a really beautiful tone. Some of these take on a really beautiful rainbow tone. Uh, very fortunate to have those. Glad I got those pieces slabbed by NGC. Um, I mentioned before, a few moments ago, the coin tubes that these come in. And... This is a question that I've been asked online uh, several occasions, and people have actually asked me uh, via email and texting, where do you get the coin tubes that are used to store the Onzas? And unfortunately, the company that made these, let me see if I can bring this into, into view here. You see where it says medallions, and it gives the, the size, that 43 millimeter. These were specifically made for the Onza. These are kind of an older style tube, and I'll just show you. If you have tried to stash your Onzas in another tube, most people try to use Silver Eagle tubes, those green topped tubes. They don't work. Uh, those are just too small. The Onza, being 92.5 silver, contain, uh, containing a full troy ounce of silver, are one of the biggest silver bullion coins you're going to find, uh, you know, aside from those two ounce or five ounce or kilo versions. These are beasts. These are really big pieces. Let me just give you a quick uh, comparison between the American silver dollar that has just absolutely dwarfed by one of these Onzas. Uh, remember that these are more pure than an American silver dollar, and they weigh considerably more than an American silver dollar. So these are beasts, one of the largest silver bullion co coins you're going to find. These tubes were made by a company called Alfred S. Colella, uh, and his company was called Invention Labs. Hopefully you can see that okay. 
uh, trying to make sure that I'm not holding it upside down there. Uh, they were based out of West Covina, California, and I believe these came out in the uh, mid to late 1990s. It's my understanding that the Invention Lab company is no longer in existence, so these are no longer being made. You can find some of these if you search for them, and hopefully that's enough information that you can try to Google this and find it. They do uh, occur, that you do see them occasionally on eBay or other auction sites. Ask your dealer to see if they've got any of them. They command pretty high premiums, and if you know of any other manufacturer out there uh, maybe somebody is 3D printing them out of safe material, then there would probably be a demand for it still. Like I said, there were about 10 million of these pieces made, and even if we think about some of them being melted, that attrition, there should still be millions of these out there, and very few people have these tubes left. I'm very fortunate that I've got four or five in my stack. So, uh, 33.625 grams of 0.925 silver means that each one contains one full troy ounce of silver. This is a difficult concept for people to wrap their heads around. You hear that instead of 999 silver, it's only 92.5% pure silver. Keep in mind that these weigh considerably more than a troy ounce so that they contain one troy ounce worth of 999 silver. These are troy ounce silver vehicles. They're just in the form of a 925 silver coin. In that context, again, we've talked about before, this was when Mexico had released a 72% pure coinage, the Maria Teresa Taller at 83.3% pure, the American and Mexican silver standard at 90% pure. So for Mexico to up the game and come out with a 92.5% pure silver coin, that was pretty innovative. There's that innovation word we were talking about earlier. They saw the writing on the wall. They realized that even though people had grown up and grown accustomed with your parents, your grandparents, your great, 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 great grandparents spending silver coins, it was probably never going to be circulating again. So Mexico with, saw the writing on the wall and upped that silver percentage. They went from that 72%, that 90%, that 83.3% pure up to 92.5% pure. And that was actually a pretty good idea. Um, when you think about it, they had made these pieces even more pure than most people had ever seen for a coin. But again, things were shifting, things were changing. No longer were these silver coins ever going to be circulating again. So even though Mexico had upped the game and bumped these up to 92.5% pure, it still wasn't really what the market was looking for. And I think a lot of that has to do with those Engelhard and Johnson Matthey and even some of those art bars that we've talked about in the past in Stacking, Mexi or, uh, Stacking Silver Bar series. Those were really the first time that most consumers had ever seen a 999 pure silver vehicle. You weren't a scientist. You weren't in some kind of investment brokerage firm. These, in a lot of ways, were made for those same people that were looking for a way to hold silver. Everybody was still interested in having silver, and if you suddenly had an opportunity to buy a consumer bar that was 999 pure silver, that was interesting. That was unique. It doesn't get any more pure than that for most people. So here was the first opportunity that a lot of people had ever seen to buy something, to hold something that was pure silver. Mexico saw the writing on the wall, again, leading that innovation, and they started to shift gears. Now, it's important to talk about one other aspect of these before we go on to the Libertad, and that is that they have a lot of similarities in a lot of ways, but one of the main differences between these two is that the Onza was never monetized. It is not a legal tender vehicle. Why does that matter? It kind of comes into play if you are in a municipality, if you're in a country that values bullion products differently than legal tender products. Uh, there are some tariffs, there are some taxes where the legal tender status of a vehicle actually matters when it comes to things like paying taxes on profits. It doesn't really matter that much to me and honestly to most stackers in the United States. It probably doesn't matter that much, but it's always a good idea to have that knowledge. Remember, I'm trying to arm you with as much knowledge as possible if this is a concern of yours. And it's not a bad idea to look into it just to make sure 
The Onzas were never monetized. They are not a legal tender vehicle. It's a, a fine distinction, and I'm not exactly sure why Mexico didn't do that. Clearly, they had monetized the 25 peso 1968, the 100 peso 1979. The 1978, 79, and 80 onzas did not have a face value. They were not technically a coin, <clears throat> more along the lines of a metal. I don't think it's doing uh, the owns as a service to, to compare them to those American art medals of about the same period of time. They suffered from some of the same disadvantages that the owns did and the fact that they didn't have a face value on them. Uh, these pieces, no face value. Um, but it was in that context that Mexico started to shift gears. Clearly, there was still a consumer demand for silver Mexico has a centuries-long tradition of producing amazing silver vehicles, silver coins. We talked about those Grove medals being some really exciting, interesting silver medals. Mexico really knew how to make a silver coin, and it was in that context. The writing on the wall was out there that they shifted gears so quickly. I think it's easy to forget this was before the era of the Internet this was really before the era of computer-aided design. There was no 3D printing, nothing like that. Mexico went from producing a large 925 one-ounce silver coin in the Onza to producing a 999 silver coin in the Libertad. 1982, the first year they produced these. So in the space of a very short period of time, we're talking uh, 1980, probably 81, uh, when they really started gearing up, and by 1982, they were able to release the 999 Silver Libertad. Released in 1982, it was the first sovereign 999 Silver coin. It's from a sovereign nation. This is not a privately produced round, uh, which had been around for a little bit longer than that. Uh, some rounds coming out in the early 1970s. The first one produced by a sovereign country. 999 Pure Silver, uh, annually dated. So this wasn't a restrike. Mexico had no interest in doing a restrike, and there's a reason they talk about those restrikes specifically. I have some early literature from the country of Mexico, from the Mexico Mint, talking about the release of the Libertad, and they hype on the fact that these are not going to be restrikes. Who do you think they were gunning for? Yep, they were gunning for the Maria Teresa Tala. Remember, for a lot of the world, this was how you bought silver. This was the known quantity. Mexico with the Libertad was gunning for the uh, Maria Teresa Taller. So much of that literature, um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, I can't really reproduce it because it doesn't come across very well in a video in a still image, but that literature talks about the fact that these are 999 pure silver. Interestingly, I remember that context in hindsight being 2020. They talk about you're not going to need to assay these pieces when you go to sell them. It's weird to think about. We don't ever really stop to think about when you have a roll of silver eagles or a few maples having to assay them to show somebody what their purity level is. That's because we are so used to the concept of these known, recognized, understood 999 silver vehicles that we just take it for granted. It is what it is. Now, that doesn't mean we don't test and verify, but we certainly don't worry about drawing an assay with them. And this is one of the things that Mexico mentioned in that <clears throat> early literature about the release of the Libertad. They talk about the fact that you're never going to have to assay them. They talk about the fact that they are not restrikes and that they will be making them every year with that date on them. And they talk about them being a full troy ounce of silver. And they talk about them being 999 silver. And they talk about them being legal tender. They were gunning hard for the Maria Teresa Toller. Did it work? Yeah, I think it worked. Uh, we don't even really consider the Maria Teresa Toller anymore as something other than kind of an interesting once in your stack kind of opportunity to have something that's got a little bit of a different appeal to them. These were the reigning king or queen, if you will, of bullion silver. 83.3% pure, 0.75 of a Troyans. The Libertad blew the doors off of it. 999 silver, a full troy ounce of silver. One of the things that I really like about the Libertad 
is that they are chunky. This is a chunky little coin. And Mexico, I think, did that intentionally. Remember, they were up against the Maria Teresa Toller, which is a very thin, broad coin. The thing about something that is broad is that it's got a lot of surface area. You don't really feel the heft in that quite as much. When you've got something that's really compact and chunky like this, like the original Libertad's, you really feel that weight in your hand. They knew that that was kind of a visceral thing. Mexico got it right. That's also a beautiful design. We've talked about that design before in the 1921 two peso, this winged liberty, winged independence design. Uh, coming on the, the heels of the Augusta St. Gaudens $20 gold piece, I think they're a very similar piece. I think they're very beautiful, both of them in their own right. But I think Mexico made a great choice with choosing that as the design for the Libertad. A stunningly beautiful coin. Earth-shattering, groundbreaking. We look at that from the perspective of the 21st century when every single silver bullion coin is one troy ounce. Every single bullion coin out there is 999 silver. Every single silver bullion coin that is made by a sovereign country, with very few exceptions, is monetized. It is legal tender. All of these things were first done by Mexico way back in 1982. That's a pretty astonishing thing to think about. Uh, they do have a denomination. So these are monetized. These are legal tender. How much is, is the, uh, the worth, the value of a Libertad? It's one onza. It's one ounce of pure silver. That is the amount that these actually carry. This is their legal tender, legal status. That's how much they are worth. One ounce of pure silver. And in that regard, they are kind of similar to the gold Krugerrands from South Africa. Those are a Krugerrand. What is a Krugerrand? It's a one ounce gold coin, and it was designed to be spent at the value of one ounce of pure gold. It is a legal tender coin in a lot of respects, the same way that the Onza, or the Libertad rather, is a legal tender coin from Mexico. Uh, 1982 for the uh, Libertad, 1986 for the Eagle, 1988 for the Maple. So the Libertad was so many years ahead of most of the other sovereign countries to start putting out a silver coin. They really were innovators. There's that innovation again. Uh, they made some changes to the uh, Libertad over time. It's important to note that Libertads always have kind of a small mintage. The largest annual mintage, I think, is the 1992, and that's a whopping two and a half million pieces. That is dwarfed by most other major silver bullion vehicles, those one ounce versions in particular. Uh, but they often had fewer than a half million, fewer than 500,000 pieces made. And, and as I understand it, the 1998 only had 67,000 ounces made, or Libertads made, silver ounces. Uh, easy to con confuse the two when you read that says Onza on it, and that's why you might hear me mess that up once in a while. The Libertad, relatively small mintages. They were innovators. Mexico was innovators when it comes to the Libertad. They had a design change in 2000, which was the obverse. Remember, when we're talking about Mexican coins, the side with the state seal of Mexico on it is the obverse. That's the front of the coin. Uh, they changed it. Um, and the uh, 19, um, a little bit later, I think it was actually the 1996, they changed it to a three quarter view of Liberty. So my younger stackers out there who are buying Libertads, who have Libertads, even you older stackers out there, this is maybe the form of the Libertad that you've grown up with, the one that you're accustomed to. This one is the one that I was a little bit more accustomed to, and I have to admit that I like the older version of the Libertad a lot better. I can understand they're both being beautiful coins, but I really think this one here on the left, the classic version, if you will, this Libertad is what I think of when I think of a Libertad. And it's not just the design, although I think this design is a little bit awkward, a little bit cumbersome compared to the classic design. It's also the fact that one of the things that I liked about the Libertads when it released was released was that small size. Remember, the larger the surface area, the less it feels chunky in your hand. Uh, these were 36 millimeter. The new version of the Libertad is at 40 millimeters. So it is substantially larger. It's thinner and it's got a, a little bit more of a surface area to it. And to me, that makes it just not quite as neat as the original Libertads. 
design changes uh, happened over time. They were kind of innovative in doing that. We've obviously seen a relatively recent change in the uh, style of the American Silver Eagle, but Mexico did it first. It was a pretty radical design change. Their innovations also didn't stop there with designs. Mexico released a 120th, a 110th, a one quarter, and a one half Libertad in uh, 1991. So this is something that the United States of America still hasn't done yet. And while I appreciate the innovation for those fractional sizes, I'm not sure that they make a lot of sense for the average stacker. This is really the kind of thing that you might want to collect. The premiums that I saw on those uh, 20th, 120th um, Libertads, you know, those pieces contain uh, somewhere in the area of $2, $2.50 worth of silver, routinely selling in the 10 to $15 range. That is an enormous premium to be paying on something for your stack. If you want a couple for your collection, I'm not going to tell you no. I wouldn't consider them part of my silver stack. That's just way too high of a premium for them. Now, I'm going to call myself out here in a few minutes and maybe you'll get a chuckle out of it, but I am who I am, warts and all. Uh, the Fractionals, 1991. 1996, Mexico releases a two ounce and a five ounce version of it. That's pretty innovative. And in 2008, Mexico released a kilo, over 31 ounces of silver in the form of a Libertad. Um, you know, if you can find them with a low premium, I don't have a problem with including those in a stack. It's really when those premiums start to take over that it really crosses that boundary between collection and stack. And that's where you really have to go with your gut, whatever feels right. As I always say, this is a personal journey. If it feels good to you, if it feels right to you, nobody else can make that determination for you. To me, those premiums just a little bit too high, not something I would really include in my silver stack. Again, I'm going to eat those words in a minute. The Libertad is legal tender. They were designed to be exchanged at the rate of a troy ounce. Remember, we talked a little bit about those uh, taxes. If you are worried about uh, importation of these pieces into your country, if your municipality treats them differently, if there's different tariffs, if there's different taxes, keep in mind that the Libertad monetized. It is a legal tender coin. The Onza, not monetized, is not a legal tender coin. Mexico released beautiful proof versions of the Libertad. And this is um, kind of an example. I think in the late 1980s, mid to late 1980s, Mexico was just really good at producing these cameo black and white proofs. Uh, this is just a gorgeous cameo proof. An example of how well Mexico was able to manipulate and make these pieces fascinating. There's that innovation again. But this is a proof Libertad. This is a 1983 PCGS Proof 69 DCAM owns a, a Libertad Onza. Now, the 1983 was really the first year that they made uh, proof versions of this. There are, I believe, a couple of examples of the 1982 out there, uh, literally two examples that I'm aware of, probably uh, made specifically for the Mints archives themselves. The 1983 was really the first year that they made a proof that anybody could buy. But again, this series was still so new in 1983. Mexico was very conservative with the number of pieces they made. And guess how many proof uh, Libertads they made in 1983? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. They made a whopping 998. That's it. The mintage for the 1983 proof Libertad was 998. Uh, when I bought this piece several years ago, it was one of two that were in that proof DCAM 69 condition. Again, that Sheldon scale where coins are graded on a scale of 1 to 70. Proofs also graded on a scale of 1 to 70. You wouldn't traditionally see a proof much lower than 65. Even that might raise some eyebrows. A 69 is really about as high as you can get, especially when it comes to things like deep cameo. That's what that stands for, that DCAM. This is a 69 decam. There were two of them when uh, I bought this piece many, many years ago. And since then, several others have been submitted to PCGS. They now uh, have six Proof 69 decams in this series. 
NGC a little bit more loose when it comes to modern proof. I think, my opinion, there are a lot of people out there who think that they are equal. Some people also might even think that NGC is more strict when it comes to grading proof coins. In my opinion, PCGS, especially when this piece was graded and slabbed, was extremely difficult. And this was a very unique piece, like I said, one of only two known uh, at the time that I bought this. Um, PCGS, six of these now. NGC has 24 of them. So uh, it could be that people are just submitting more of them to NGC, but it's also possible that people see NGC as a little bit more loose with their grading standards when it comes to these really high-end proofs. NGC with 24 of them. So the entire population at this point, there's nothing higher than a 69. There are only 30 of them graded across both uh, NGC and PCGS. Very fortunate to have them. And this is the words that I told you I was going to be eating when I bought this piece. I did not collect Mexican proofs. I still don't. I have a few of them. This did not fit into my coin collection anywhere. So I had to convince myself that this was simply one troy ounce of pure silver. So even though it costs considerably more than that, it cost me a lot more than that when I bought it, and the prices have gone ballistic on these. It is worth so much more than what I paid for it. In my records, in my stack, this piece represents one troy ounce of silver, and that's it. So we won't even include that one in this picture anymore. Just wanted to give you an idea of some of the pieces that I have. The last thing I wanted to talk about is these rolls that you see up here at the top of your screen. These are original mint wrapped rolls of Onzas. This is how they looked when they were first released from the Mexican mint from the Bank of Mexico. They came in these shotgun rolls, and if that looks familiar, uh, beautiful tone on some of these. Some of these have just wild rainbow toning. In this case, it's kind of a peach champagne, maybe a little bit of a strawberry look to it. Um, a very beautiful coin. Tends to be those end pieces, those ones that get the oxidation from being exposed to air. Um, these carry a really high premium. And you might recall one of these, I made a video where I talked about rotating out of some of my early uh, 10 ounce Engelhard silver bars, those commercial series bars, in exchange for one of these bank wrapped rolls these have become quite scarce. This was the way that these were released when they were originally released. Uh, we are used to seeing those uh, green top rolls of American silver eagles. This was the way that the Bank of Mexico released the Libertad. So it's not entirely unusual to think that some people simply put these back in those safe deposit boxes in their home vaults or in the cigar box under the bed, and that's the way they stayed. But they have gotten particularly scarce recently. If you are a stacker and you like this kind of silver, you know that the Libertads have become really expensive. The premiums on these pieces have gone up considerably over the last two or three years. Uh, they compete with, and I think sometimes they even are more expensive than maples and uh, even silver eagles. Some of these sell for 40 or $50 a piece. These rolls have an even higher premium than the individual coins. And I think that you're only going to see that continue to increase over time. Doesn't mean I'm telling you to go out and buy one. I was able to rotate into some for uh, essentially what I paid for those Englehard bars. So it was almost kind of a straight swap. Now, you have to ask yourself, would you rather have the Englehard, Englehard 10 ounce bars in original vinyl flips? Or would you rather have uh, these uncirculated original rolls of Libertads? I'll leave a link down to that video below so you can kind of see my thought processes as I worked through it and decided ultimately that I wanted the Libertad rolls and their original shotgun holders. Wow. Mexican Silver uh, Volume 4 Part B, the 1980 to the present. We talked about some of the history of Mexico. We talked about that Grove Metal featuring the co coin press on the front. We talked about the ounces and the context with which they were released. Mexico realizing that there was still a desire for these silver pieces. Um, and then shifting gears so quickly between 1980 with the last of the ounces and 1982 with the first of the Libertads. They really were innovators. They really broke new ground. And, and frankly, the rest of the world is struggling to catch up. Uh, you know, 35, 40 years later, it was still Mexico that launched these pieces first, arguably the first monetized legal tender, one troy ounce, 999 silver sovereign nation bullion vehicle. 
everybody else owes it to the Mexicans for really doing the groundwork and putting that blueprint in place way back uh, before 1982. Stacking Mexican Silver, Volume 4, Part B, 1980 to the present. Um, that's the, the conclusion of this series, with the exception of one small video I'm going to make and kind of tag on as an ancillary, as an appendix to this series. I'm going to give you White Cross's choice when it comes to all of the Mexican and Spanish colonial pieces that we've talked about in the series. I'm going to name the five pieces that I am most attracted to, and I'm going to kind of detail exactly why I feel those pieces are some of the more interesting pieces, the more fun pieces to have in my stack. And uh, maybe we can start a conversation about which pieces you like best in your stack. Stacking Mexican Silver, Volume 4, Part B. I want to thank you for being on this journey with me. If you have any questions about any of the coins that we talked about in this video or any of the preceding videos, by all means leave a comment down below and I'll try to address it if I can. If you feel that I missed anything, if there's anything else that you'd like to see me talk about, I can certainly take a look and see if I've got the knowledge base and the pieces that we can take a look at, see if there's something I can add and uh, maybe make a video about that as well. And as you know, I like to end all of my videos. I want to thank you for being with me on my journey, but I also want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey as you go deeper into the world of physical precious metals.